Hey everybody, welcome to Crazy Tech Lab and today I've got a fantastic video for you because I've been talking to AMD's Mark Papermaster, its Chief Technology Officer, on how he helped turn the, around the company's fortunes back in 2011 when he joined the company and also leading up to the launch of the Ryzen CPUs and the Zen architecture in 2017. He was very instrumental in that. I'm going to get his thoughts on how successful that launch was and what the company has been doing since then to increase its market share and basically dominate the CPU marketplace. And we'll also be talking about our favorite CPUs as well in the, in the range of Ryzen and Threadripper CPUs. And finally, we will be talking about what AMD's plans are next for 2022 and everything that you should be getting excited about from AMD. So we've got a whole bunch of stuff to get through and uh, Mark's been kind enough to lend me some of his time to talk about all these things. So don't forget to uh, watch through to the end of the video because there's some really, really interesting stuff about what AMD's launches are going to be like next year. And we've got loads and loads of great stuff to look forward to. So don't forget to subscribe to Crazy Tech Lab. It means a lot to have your support. And don't forget to comment below as well on like this video if you found it informative and fun. Always interested to hear your thoughts both on this video and on your own PC or your view of the PC industry at the moment. And um, obviously, obviously, I want to see your comments focusing on AMD. What do you think it's done over the last few years? Do you think it's done pretty well? Do you, would, you, would you have expected more? Do you want to see more from it? What do you want to see in future? And that's pretty much it. So let's crack on with the interview and uh, we'll catch up again at the end. Thanks for joining me today to talk about um, a few things AMD. And uh, so you joined AMD in 2011, Mark. And um, I know that before that, you worked uh, for several other high profile companies. And I was just wondering if you could give us a brief overview of what those companies were and any key proje uh, projects or products that you were involved with. Sure. Well, I've been very fortunate because I'm coming on almost 40 years in the industry. And so when you think about it, when I started, it was like the birth of the PC. The IBM uh, PC had, had just come out. Yeah. And so, you know, the, the whole way in which we all work with computers was about to change. Computers used to be these big behemoths uh, that were behind, uh, you know, walls of you know, massive mainframes. And, and the reason it was called personal computing uh, era is it was just that. So it was very exciting to get in the ground floor and, and also at a time of significant technology change. And so new semiconductor approaches, which were uh, much lower power and, and could scale and, and, you know, CMOS technology has now been the fundamental basis of how we've been doing our chip designs for, uh, you know, for almost 40 years, uh, we're becoming prevalent. So I had many uh, years in IBM where I was able to really grow the use of, of technology and, and, uh, and apply that across uh, everything from PCs to uh, mainframes and supercomputers. So what a great way to, to start the career on, on, on bringing computing across, you know, really every uh, segment. And um, after a number of years there, I did leave because I uh, wanted to try something new. And I went uh, to Apple. Steve Jobs recruited me to run uh, iPod and iPhone. And wow. so I reported yeah. to him and, and uh, ran that development. And we were working on, you know, iPhone 3 at the time, iPhone 4, the, some of the technologies that came out in the later generations. And that was a great opportunity because like IBM of really uh, bringing the, um, you know, the technology, hardware and software together, that's what Apple did with the advent of the iPhone. And it really changed our experience. And so personal computing became, uh, you know, really uh, having that computer with you in your pocket and you could, you know, do all the things you're used to with the PC and more, right, at the inclusion of the camera and uh, teleconference, video conferencing uh, capabilities. Uh, then I, I moved on to uh, Cisco to run uh, uh, routing and switching silicon technologies. And then 10 years ago, I took this role as uh, both CTU and running the technology and engineering division where, uh, you know, our products uh, also span from PCs to, uh, you know, uh, just a really intense graphics processing and gaming uh, up to main, uh, up to not, not mainframe, but uh, data center computing and supercomputers. And we're just, in fact, launching uh, uh, with uh, HP Enterprise and with uh, U.S. Uh, Department of Energy uh, what we think will be the largest supercomputer with over uh, one exaflop of, of uh, computing capabilities as it gets stood up uh, uh, through the end of this year. Yeah, no, that, that sounds absolutely fantastic. And I'm just very envious that you got in there a few years before me and got to see the, you know, the birth of what we're all dealing with now. So um, I guess um, it's no secret to anybody that AMD was maybe not in a 
particularly competitive phase when he joined in 2011. And um, it was a full six years before we'd see the introduction of the Zen architecture and Ryzen CPUs. And I think everybody's interested in how things were turned around, both in terms of AMD's goals and its internal culture, uh, to go from that time in 2011 uh, to the launch of the Zen architecture in 2017. So I'm just wondering if you could tell me a bit more about how that happened and how you achieved that. Well, Anthony, it, it, you know, what attracted me to join AMD, it was, you know, really an opportunity of a lifetime because I had worked with AMD and I knew that the innovative talent on the AMD team was, was unparalleled. And it, if you look at AMD, it's an over 50 year old company with mm -hmm. uh, innovation after innovation that, that was able to uh, shake up computing and, and bring competition. And then the acquisition of ATI in, in uh, 2006 that uh, brought on, you know, such a strong, uh, graphics capability, a leading graphics capability, and that was that was a very smart move. Uh, but the the challenge was uh, to get all of those pieces to come together uh, to bring the uh, CPU roadmap back to leadership computing capability, uh, and really make sure that we revamp the engineering processes so that AMD could be there each and every product cycle and be it you know just completely dependable uh, to be out on time and with the quality and. Uh, with, with all of that storied innovation that AMD had been famous for. And so it was what a, what a huge opportunity uh, that, I, uh, that I jumped at. And so, you know, the key thing was uh, really uh, bringing the leadership together and aligning with them on this vision uh, of, you know, how we could uh, reset that engineering approach. And, you know, I just can't say enough about the talent at AMD. Not, not everyone stayed, right, when you have that much uh, you know, uh, surgery that you're doing into the way, the way that you go about <laughs> getting the products out. Uh, it wasn't for everyone, uh, but uh, so many of the uh, key leaders and innovators have stayed and they're the real story of the success of, uh, of AMD in this turnaround. And you did mention it took a, a few years. Well, uh, that is unfortunately uh, a part about hardware development that differentiates us from, let's say you're a software startup. It, it just takes longer. Uh, we started right away uh, revamping, you know, how we put all of the building blocks together. We call it uh, the infinity architecture. We started that, um, you know, literally in, in uh, Q1 of 2012. I had only been there a few months. And, wow. And, okay. Uh, we, oh, yeah. Um, so that was huge. So you had to get the underpinnings right. And then we, in uh, uh, late 2012, uh, we started the, uh, the, the makings of the Zen processor. It kicked off at the uh, end of 2012. And it, and it, it does take uh, five years uh, to get a new uh, CPU from scratch, a new microarchitecture uh, design out there. Wow, that's, yeah, that's amazing. That's, um, I knew that things didn't happen overnight, but it's amazing that you started working on that all the way back in 2012 for a 2017 launch. So that, that's really fascinating. So I guess um, most enthusiasts are familiar with the Zen architecture and maybe even uh, the more tech savvy out there might know about infinity fabric and core complexes and chiplets and those terms. So what were the main reasons for opting for a very different design with the Zen architecture, a modular uh, design, if you will? And um, obviously it, it lent itself to boosting multi-threaded performance uh, in perhaps a slightly easier way. Um, and that's a performance that had languished a bit and we haven't really seen much boost to core and thread counts for quite a while. So that was maybe ripe for some, for, uh, for some development. So was it that reason or was it a whole bunch of different reasons that you decided to go for a, a modular design? And uh, I guess also another question is, was, was that maybe even a risky move? Well, it, it, change is a risky move. You, but when, when you're uh, at a position where we were, uh, frankly, uh, change is required, right? Because we had to turn around the trajectory at AMD, and you have to do that as a technology company with technology innovation. So, in, in a way, the the position we were at in the industry uh, did us a favor. We we were in I'll call it a crisis mode, and you've heard that phrase: never uh, let a good crisis go to waste. Well, we didn't. Uh, the team galvanized. I mean, what what an incredible, uh, not only innovative spirit at AMD, but a fighting spirit. So being that underdog with a, with a will and a way to come back was, was an overpowering culture across AMD, as well as a culture of collaboration. So uh, you, you, you talk about modularity. Well, we uh, really looked at where the industry was going and we said, look, 
Moore's law is slowing down. Moore's law is the, is the, the, the technology uh, trend that all of us uh, had, had uh, leveraged in the industry where every new semiconductor technology node just allowed you to scale performance and you could raise the frequency and it would still be at the same uh, you know, uh, cost. Uh, mm -hmm. So you could double the number of transistors but have that product be at the same uh, uh, cost and power. You, you can still improve the density with each of our new uh, technology nodes today but it is more expensive uh, and you cannot keep on the same frequency pace. Yeah. We saw that coming over 10 years ago. And so we, we realized that we would need a modular approach to put the pieces together. And so you see that today across our, our uh, high-end CPU, our high-end GPU, we're leveraging that modularity. And Anthony, in your question on the CPU, uh, look, that, that was uh, really, I give the credit to Mike Clark, our, our chief engineer, uh, and, and the focus, uh, we, we knew that we could never let go of what we call single thread performance. How does a single x86 CPU perform? We had to, to clearly have leadership uh, and, and you have to combine it with scalability so that not only is that single CPU provide a leadership capability, uh, but as you add more and more cores, uh, you, you could, uh, that we would scale. And so we, we basically brought up the amount of memory and interconnect uh, IO capability with the CPU. And that was a breakthrough. The, the industry, the x86 industry had stagnated yeah. and we were a disruptive force to bring you know, uh, significant generational performance gains with each generation of Zen microprocessor uh, to the market and, and, and bring healthy competition back. It's been really exciting. Yeah, no, I've certainly enjoyed seeing uh, the journey over the last couple of years, and we've we've had a you know fairly aggressive product roadmap to deal with, and it's meant a lot of work for people like me reviewing the things and writing about them. So, um, I think because it was so aggressive uh, for for myself, I kind of set my own requirements for what I consider to be a successful range of CPUs with AMD. So, for example. The first generation, it was about establishing Ryzen as a force to be reckoned with in the market and boosting multi-threaded performance um, that had stagnated for years, as we've just been speaking about, and also clawing back market share from the competition. And I think with the second generation, it was building on those things and seeing that performance envelope extended. And with the Ryzen 5 2600, I think that CPU was the best-selling CPU of any desktop CPU for a period after that. So that, that was a really impressive feat as well. So um, I'm just wondering, did uh, AMD feel like uh, you achieved what you wanted to with each generation? And um, from our point of view, you know, there's there's been some real uh, some real winners in there. I've certainly got my own favorite products. So what, what did AMD want to achieve with each of those four generations? And do you think you were successful in, in doing all of that? Well, yes. Yeah, so, I mean, when you think about what we're trying to achieve in each generation, it's to, to bring a better experience. So you, you look at the PC market and it was being underserved. Uh, if you look at notebooks, the, the battery life, you know, just wasn't improving generation, generationally as it should have. Mm -hmm. uh, the the uh, graphics technology uh, wasn't being exploited as, as, as fast as it could have. And we set out to change that at AMD to bring a better experience, better computing, a better graphics, better uh, performance for watt of energy, which would help notebooks. But turns out it also helped desktops. What about gamers that want, you know, the uh, you know just a tremendous experience? It depends on uh, a great CPU, a great GPU, and 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 that the CPU and GPU can communicate uh, between each other very very effectively. That's what gives uh, consumers a great experience, uh, and that's what we focused on every generation. Look, we're we're uh, uh, so excited about this upcoming consumer electronics show in mm -hmm. uh, Las Vegas in January. It'll be a hybrid event. Uh, so we'll have some folks there and, and many folks are still virtual, uh, but we uh, could not be more thrilled with even the, the next generation of products, uh, which of course I can't share uh, that detail with uh, yet here. Of course, yeah. yeah. But, <laughs> but, but Anthony, stay tuned. Uh, we're, we're, we are not letting uh, the foot off the proverbial uh, gas pedal here. We're full mm -hmm. speed ahead. Yeah, no, that, that sounds great. And we're, we're very much looking forward to 2022. So um, moving on from the initial launch of Zen in 2017, um, what were the main learnings over the last four years since that launch? Uh, I mean, obviously, as we just mentioned, CPUs aren't designed and manufactured overnight. Um, so a lot of this would have been planned, you know, years in advance. But what's your take on AMD's progress since 2017? And have there been any specific challenges since then that you've had to overcome? 
Yeah, no, absolutely. You know, one thing uh, I love about our AMD culture, not only is it innovative and collaborative, uh, but we're really good at listening and we listen to our, our customers. And so uh, by no means was our first launch of Zen perfect. It, it got us back in the competitive race. Uh, we didn't have a, at the time single thread performance uh, leadership. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, that, that came with the generations uh, two and then really a generation uh, that with the Zen three that you know really has just been such an outstanding leader in the industry, yeah. uh, you know, on both single thread and, and multi-thread. So one, uh, we learned to iterate and, and to grow that uh, performance gain uh, at each generation. Uh, but also, uh, you know, we, we learn along the way. So uh, what we found with the first generation, I talked about gaming a moment ago, uh, the, the latency, the delay of our CPU uh, and to uh, memory uh, in the first generation and certain gaming workloads was not the best that, that mm -hmm. we could make it. And so we improved it on generation two. And guess what? Our gaming performance uh, went up significantly. Uh, and, and our market share went up significantly. Gamers yep. are very discerning. Uh, and they, you know, they, they noticed immediately when we made those, those changes. The other thing we focused on is uh, quality across the board. When I think back to those first generations, um, uh, we had very good quality, uh, but we also had, uh, we learned we had a, 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 um, a, a driver release that had a, a quality issue. We, we corrected it very, very quickly, mm -hmm. but we learned from that. And now, we do uh, testing that mimics exactly how our users, our, our customers use our product. And so we don't want any surprises when our, our uh, product comes out. It, it, we wanna have already tested exactly as you are using it. Uh, and I have many other examples, but we, we really, uh, uh, really uh, I think been self-reflective at every launch. And I'm uh, again, incredibly proud of the team uh, with what they've done, not only on the performance and capability, uh, but with the quality and the applications uh, that we that we're bringing uh, onto our platform. Mm. So I guess uh, looking back, maybe as far back as 2011, is there anything that you might have done slightly differently, maybe with a uh, you know with a, an individual CPU or range of CPUs, or perhaps more generally, um, is there something that you might change given uh, what what you know now uh, compared to back in 2011? Well, we did the changes, Anthony, along the way. It, it, you know, you can't. Uh, you've got to be quick on your feet. You know, we'd done the first generation of Zen 1, uh, and as we were doing Zen 2, uh, we, we uh, the original design we had Zen 2, uh, we had very, very good metrics, and the team looked at it and said, My, you know, we're, we're going to be late to market. And, mm -hmm. you know, I mentioned, uh, you know, Mike Clark earlier as our chief architect, and, uh, you know, as we flagged the problem, uh, you know, he came and said, look, uh, we can modify how we were, we were thinking about doing Zen 2, uh, hold our schedule, make sure that, again, that we're on time to market for uh, where our customers are, are banking on us, uh, yet, yet bring, uh, you know, a significant gain in performance, exactly what they're looking for. But you saw, you commented earlier that the, the se second generation of Zen uh, was, was a hit. Yeah. But what you did, you know, people didn't see under the covers if we weren't reacting real time. Uh, you know, and, and watching our progress, we we would have been late. And so, mm -hmm. you, you know, when you say what we've been would have done different, uh, what we try and do is do different things along the way as we need to to make sure uh, that we are seamless in our execution, that we we don't uh, uh, drop a bit in terms of uh, what we committed uh, to our end customers. Yeah. Okay. That's, that's really interesting. Um, so, I, I mean, for me, I'm, I'm getting pretty granular here. Um, I was wondering if you had any standout products like individual desktop CPUs that you were maybe big fans of that maybe nailed their intended market um, or were particularly competitive. I mean, for me, the uh, first and second generation six core models were just really great because they offered that that big bump in multi-threaded performance that we hadn't really seen at, at those price points before. And of course, for me, the, the flagship 16 core models are absolutely fantastic because you get high-end desktop performance on the, on the mainstream desktop. So I was just wondering if there's anything, any standout generation or even an individual CPU that you think, wow, you know, that was, that was a really great hit in terms of one of our products. Well, I, you know, we're, we at AMD are proud of, uh, of all the <laughs> generations. Hey, by the way, I'll just say one thing, Anthony, uh, that the team takes it personally. Uh, so they're all like our babies. Uh, <laughs> and and uh, it's amazing when you talk to the engineers and you just see the pride uh, they have as they bring their innovation 
uh, to bear. But I do want to call out uh, our current generation with, with Zen 3 and, and what we've been, done with the whole Ryzen 5000 uh, line here is pretty amazing uh, because it brought uh, absolute leadership uh, and, and it did allow us to extend the product range. And so you talked about, you know, uh, the different core counts that we could offer. Mm -hmm. and, and so what we love about that is we were able to bring uh, value. If you're a cost conscious consumer in PCs, we could give you excellent computing at value, but if you're a high performance uh, consumer, so you, you might be a gamer, you know, we could scale you all the way up, not only to the 16 core, but think about the Threadripper yeah. uh, offering that we have that's just a beast. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we scale it all the way into workstations. I mean, you can run literally 64 core uh, workstations uh, that is just a, a phenomenal beast of, uh, of computing. Uh, and so, you know, that's what we've been focused on. And then I, I, I talk about that innovation and we announced at Computex last year that in addition to that on, on Zen 3, that we can stack vertically, what we call it Vcache, uh, yeah. where we can put additional memory, take it up on a single core up to uh, 96 megabyte of uh, level three cache. That's another innovation. It's not, not uh, you know, as we said, it'll be uh, shipping uh, as we enter 2022. But now you're now you're going to take a, a product line that we're already incredibly proud of and put it on on steroids. Yeah, <laughs> uh, so it's been quite the product family. Okay, so uh, more recently uh, we've had the launch of Windows 11, and that obviously threw up, uh, threw up a few issues uh, with Ryzen CPUs. So, um, do you can see consider those issues mainly fixed with Windows 11 now, or is that going to be like an, an ongoing process uh, for the foreseeable future, uh, optimizing your products for the new operating system? Yeah, we, we have a deep partnership with Microsoft and we do extensive testing on uh, any release. And, and it was prior to the release of Windows 11, but frankly, too late uh, that we caught that we had some uh, issues in, in uh, working in partnership with them. And so that's why you saw the patch go out so quickly. Uh, we, we caught it. We were working with them uh, on that and, and uh, very, very quickly uh, got uh, the uh, uh, performance issue patched. Uh, so what we've done going forward is we've modified our our uh, way in which we work with Microsoft and we backed up uh, much earlier uh, where we do uh, the kind of testing that would have caught that. So uh, I, I can assure our customers that again, we, we learn, uh, we learn uh, at AMD, we learn with our partners uh, anytime something doesn't go uh, basically perfect uh, and we take action. And we've certainly done that in partnership with Microsoft going forward. Okay, that's, that's good to hear. So um, looking forward to 2022 and we're obviously very excited about the launch of uh, Zen 4 and another generation of Ryzen CPUs. So what are your hopes for the new architecture and what do you think PC enthusiasts like me will be impressed with and most excited about? And also has that architecture presented any specific challenges? Well, without getting into the details of, uh, of uh, forthcoming architectures, I can tell you uh, what we're focused on across the board in our roadmap going forward. Uh, it is an ever enhanced experience. Uh, you know, you think about our early years, AMD had to get back in the, in the forefront of, of consumers' mind. You know, we, we were, we had been the value play. Okay, you know, did you want, you know, uh, the other guy or did you want value? If you want value, go with AMD. Well, we, we wanted to go way beyond value. We want to have the best performance. We want to have the best experience. And so once we got back in the game of delivering performance, uh, it, it brought us a seat at the table with all of our gaming partners, with all of our PC partners, all the way through our server products that we offer. Uh, we have a seat at the table because we're bringing leadership technology to bear. And that's allowed us to really uh, more deeply optimize for the end experience. So what you should what you should expect is, you know, in, in notebooks, um, you know, ever increasing uh, battery life, ever increasing, uh, you know, quality of, of, uh, of, of service, uh, enhanced applications where we're working more closely uh, with third part, first party and third party application providers uh, so that you have, uh, you know, just a, a much more lifelike uh, and just great experience. And we do that across our product line. We're doing that, you know, in, in uh, gaming. We work with our console partners. Uh, we work, uh, think about the image enhancements uh, uh, that, that we have uh, across our Radeon uh, graphics technology and, and then all the way through to server. Uh, so yeah, what, what you, you, we expect uh, uh, our consumers, our, our customers to have a high bar 
of expectation of, of AMD, and we're we're doing our best to uh, to meet and exceed at every generation. Okay, that, that sounds good. I'm, I'm happy with that. So um, obviously, we've been dealing with a uh, pandemic for the for the last two years. And I'm just uh, wondering if that's had any sig significant impacts on your plans for 2022. And I guess uh, maybe I'm doing a bit of digging here, if you can give a rough ETA for the launch of, uh, of the new architecture and, and CPUs. Um, obviously, <laughs> you mentioned earlier, you can't give too much away. But I'm just wondering, uh, what, were, what were your thoughts on those two things? Well, first of all, with the pandemic, um, you know, it's been, uh, you know, such a, a global uh, a challenge and and uh, certainly uh, all of us in the industry have, have had to double down because uh, as people went to work from home and to play from home, you know, gaming uh, took off during this time, uh, they're really banking on the whole technology industry to respond. And um, uh, that's what we focused on in AMD. We've uh, work very, very hard with our supply chain. I can't say enough about the AMD supply chain team uh, mm -hmm. and our manufacturing partners because uh, here it was in this in, in uh, this challenge of, of many people working from home uh, and and yet our partners keeping the factories going. And we uh, we grew our business uh, as as we said publicly. Uh, AMD will grow uh, over sixty percent in revenue this year, and that means that our our supply grew. Uh, in, in, a, in a very, very rapid way, year over year. So it was a, it, the, the pandemic was a huge challenge. Uh, our customers needed us to respond and, and uh, we have been able to grow uh, significantly uh, year over year. And, and, and we've increased, and we'll further increase our capacity uh, in 2022 and beyond. Uh, Anthony, with regard to uh, the upcoming uh, generation, uh, again, I point to CES, we couldn't be more excited uh, to be rolling out uh, some additional details on our on our uh, our new product launches. Uh, it will deliver phenomenal experience, uh, and and uh, and as well, we said publicly uh, that uh, later in the year, uh, as as it progresses, uh, we'll share uh, more detail on uh, Zen Four. Uh, Zen Four will uh, and you'll, we'll, we'll we'll talk a, a bit about it at CES, and then you'll see a rolling uh, set of announcements uh, over the course of 2022. So uh, on, on our next CPU family, and then across the board uh, on our product families across uh, PC, uh, gaming and server, 2022 is shaping up to be an incredibly exciting year for AMD. Yeah, that sounds absolutely great. So um, finally, looking beyond Zen 4 then, and uh, what are AMD's goals here in terms of innovation? And can you elaborate a bit more on your Moore's Law Plus uh, philosophy that I've, I, I've heard so much about? Sure, I, I call it Moore's Law Plus because, as I said earlier, you know, more, that traditional Moore's Law is gone, and mm -hmm. and yet uh, we still need to improve uh, performance and you know capability at the same exponential pace that uh, the industry has always been on. So what uh, what we do at AMD and what what goes uh, you know beyond Moore's Law or Moore's, Moore's Law Plus uh, is uh, continuing to build on. Uh, architecting a system solution. Uh, we committed ourselves years ago at AMD, uh, starting with that acquisition of ATI to heterogeneous computing. Mm -hmm. it, it can't be the CPU alone. It can't be the GPU alone. It's a CPU, it's a GPU, it's other accelerators that you put in uh, for things like AI workloads and video processing. Sure. Uh, we have all of that in our chips. And uh, that is Moore's Law Plus. And it's how you put it together. It's not all out just on one piece of silicon anymore. It's on chiplets uh, that you put together in a very modular way. Again, mm -hmm. it goes back to the strategy that we launched 10 years ago. Uh, so that's the future. It's an incredibly bright future. It's not the way that we all used to do things, uh, but we called the ball on this one at AMD. We set up for this uh, years ago, uh, and we will uh, stay on that exponential pace of improving cap uh, you know, processing uh, capabilities each generation. Yeah, no, that sounds great. So um, that that's it from me. So thank you so much for taking the time to uh, talk to me today. It's been much appreciated. And hopefully, uh, all my readers will be uh, finding it fascinating as well. So thank you very much, Mark. Thank you, Anthony. Wow, what a fantastic interview that was with Mark. And I'd like to thank him again for taking his time out to uh, talk to me about all things Ryzen. And uh, of course, love to hear your comments on the uh, interview down below. And that's it from me. So have a fantastic Christmas. Don't forget to like, comment and subscribe and I will see you soon.